Ladies and gentlemen, please a warm welcome, Julie Masters. by step Well, that was a little bit intense, wasn't it? I'm going to, I'm going to kick off by asking you a question. I'm going to kick off by asking you a question. Who here has noticed that who and what and where influences you has changed a lot over the past few years? Hands up. Raise your hand for me. Yep. Here's a, here's a better question, more interesting question for this room. Who here has noticed that who and what and where is influencing your customers has changed massively over the past, let's say, five years? Hands up. Absolutely. Now, that, that video raises an interesting question for me, and it is this. Given all that noise, given all that distraction, given all that complexity, what does it take to stand out? What does it take to win attention and keep it? What does it take to attract rather than chase business? Because that's what we all want, right, in this room? We want to attract business. So essentially, what makes an influencer today? Now, I first, I first arrived in this fair land, fresh off the boat from the UK, about 20 years ago. And I had, I had a backpack full of massively unsuitable clothes for 40 degree weather. And I had, like every good British girl, I had two goals. Two goals. Goal number one, live near Bondi Beach. <laughs> Tick. Goal number two. Marry a surfer. <laughs> I, th that went pretty well. And, and back then, back then, I had no idea what that word meant, influencer. I had no idea. I don't think any of us did. Nobody was talking about it. It wasn't a word on anybody's lips. Whereas now, today, it feels like it is everywhere, right? Influencer, thought leader, go-to expert. In fact, true story, I got, um, I got an email, it was about a week ago now, a week to 10 days ago, to tell me that the most influential person on Instagram at this moment is an egg. Like, th honestly, check it out, the influential egg. And so I would say that most of us still don't really know what this word means. Now, I've... I've had a lot of time to think about that question, what makes an influencer over the past 20 years, not least because I ended up co-founding a management company for influencers, where we represented, developed, and promoted um, thought leaders, authors, CEOs, speakers, media personalities. Here, we had offices in America, and we had people based all over the world. Now we take those insights and those lessons and we bring them into organizations to help raise leaders and executives up as authorities in their field. So I, I guess you could say that I have spent 20 years of my life just decoding that one word, 
influencer. It doesn't sound like a lot to do with my time now that I say it out loud, but it, it, it's taken me a while. So to kick off today, I want to share with you my definition of that word, where my experiences have taken me to understand what that word means, and it is this. Essentially, a trusted expert. A trusted expert. So what does that take? What does that take? What does it take to become the most highly sought after authority in your field? To become the most highly remunerated authority in your field? What does that take? Now, I'm going to be sharing some insights with you today, some of the things that I have learned over the years and my team have learned over the years to help answer that question. But before I do, before I do, I want to kick off with a bit of a pop quiz. Does anyone here consider themselves to be a bit of a trivia expert? Anyone? No? One, one person? OK. I might stand a chance of winning this, then. <laughs> nice. Who here? Who here can tell me who this is? Oh, it's the first one. No? How about this? Oprah. Oprah. Absolutely. Who can tell me who this is? No? Who's this? This is, where I, this is where I throw out my London accent. It's Jamie. It's Jamie Oliver. All right, who can tell me who this is? Nope. How about this? Branson. Final one. Last chance to redeem yourselves. Who's this? I heard a murmuring. How about this? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Absolutely. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly run you, through, run you through the answers to that one. Number one, the first person that I showed you, you did not know who she was. Her name is Susan Wojcicki. And Susan Wojcicki is the CEO of YouTube, which makes her the most powerful woman in media probably today. And yet you had no idea who she was. The second one, the second one is Michael Brass. Michael Brass is the most celebrated chef in the world today, as voted by his peers. And you had no idea who he was. Third one, third one I personally keep in business myself, who here shops at Zara? Yeah? That's a man that was a Mancio Ortega. He is the founder and CEO of Zara. He's worth $70 billion which makes him the richest businessman, I think, on the planet today. Richard Branson, he's, he's, like, he's struggling. <laughs> struggling at billionaire poverty level down here. Just $3 billion, that's all he's got. And the last one, the last one's the reason you're all here. The last one's the reason you knew this event was even happening. That's Tim Berners-Lee. He invented the internet. He invented the internet, and you had no idea who he was. How? Why? You know, these, it's these questions that keep me, that keep me awake, because I'm a total nerd about this stuff. And so, what does that tell me, other than the fact that none of you are on my pub quiz team? Maybe you, you, you did do well. So, what does that tell me? Well, I'll tell you what it tells me first of all. It tells me a lot about what influence is not. Influence is not how long you've been doing this. It's not years in the game, it's not 10 years. Some of the most influential people that I meet and work with, they haven't been doing this as long as everybody else. Influence is also not how much money you have. It's not dollars in the bank, it's not the size of your marketing budget. And probably most importantly to me, influence is not force, it is not aggression, and it is not extrovertism, which is, I think, a myth that keeps many people far, far too small. So if it's not those things, I'm so loving these lasers, by the way. Um, if it's not those things, I'm going to come down. I'm going to ask you a question, which is going to totally mess with the people with the camera, sorry. I'm going to ask you a question. What is it? All those people that you recognized, all those people where you knew their name, what do they have in common? Just shout it out for me. It's like a full contact sport. Media, Media profile, what else? Sorry? Public figure, there was one over here. Love what they do, do, brand, charisma, passion, absolutely. 
Absolutely, to all those things. However, however, I want to put it to you that every single person that you recognized, every single person whose name you knew, they have taken advantage of this. A new age of influence. And in this new age of influence, we are now able to connect, engage, and mobilize en masse in terrifyingly short periods of time. You can go from a nobody to a somebody in under 24 hours, mobilize millions of people in 280 characters or less. Now, you had better be good when you get there. You'd better have a, a worthy idea, an idea worthy of us sharing, a movement worthy of us joining, a product that's worth us paying attention to. But that trajectory, that potential, that has never existed before in the history of mankind. And I think that it is that reason that makes it possibly one of the most exciting and challenging times to be in business today, to do what you do today. So, I'm going to take you on a brief history tour. I'm going to take you on a brief history tour, and the reason I'm going to do that is because this new age of influence, the digital age of influence, has changed my world. It's changed the world of influence as I know it. And here's the reason why. Back then, back, as far back as we can go, as far back as time began, this is what influence looked like. This is what influence looked like when my career first started. At the top, you have the powers that be, the government, the monarchy, CEO, Underneath that, you have the military, or the enforcers of the word of the power that be. Underneath that, you have the media, the people who amplify the word of the powers that be. And underneath that, you have you and me, everybody else, the general public. Just in the past five to 10 years since the digital world came into being, influence now looks like this. For the first time in history, human beings are now able to mobilize at faster rates, at greater scales than sometimes governments, increasing cases military, and definitely the media. One tweet can start and stop, or one iPhone can start or stop a revolution. And again, that's the first time in history that's ever happened. Who can tell me who that is? I love you. Usually I have to say, who here can, isn't prepared to admit that they know that who that is? But you, you are like straight away, Biebs. Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber on one social media channel. Now bear in mind, last time I checked, there were 52 social media channels. On one, Twitter, he has 100 million followers. 100 million followers. Barack Obama has 90 million followers. Donald Trump has 60 million followers. Here's what's interesting. CNN, 40 million followers. If he wanted to, after a very tiring day fending off 14-year-olds, or 40-year-olds, <laughs> not judging any of you, if he wanted to, he could get an idea out there faster. He could start a conversation. He could spread an idea, or he could sell a product faster than CNN. And again, first time that that's ever happened. Now, a lot of you might be sat there going, well, you know, I don't, I, don't really, I don't really want to be a teenage pop sensation. And I can tell you, for me, that ship has sailed. However, if you're a business person or an entrepreneur, this number is way more interesting. 96%. 96% of every single thing that you look at online, on your smart device or on your laptop, and you spend 8.5 hours a day, by the way, now, consuming and being influenced by content online. 93% of your buying decisions are influenced by what you read online. 96% of it is what we would call unbranded, which is just a really fancy way of saying that it came directly from a human being and not from a brand. Only 4% of our attention now comes from brands or is, or is given to brands. The rest of it is given to human beings. And yet, as industry, we spend a whopping $50 billion a year on marketing, branding, and advertising. And nobody is looking. Nobody is looking. It's like building the world's sexiest billboard and putting it under the ocean. Who we are watching, who we are following, who we are being influenced by are human beings. People follow people. We don't follow brands. Influence has now become the ability to say, look, look over there and have people be engaged enough to look. A compelling brand, a credible brand, a compelling and credible product, a compelling and credible idea, that has become what we look at. 
The attention belongs to the human being. So you take compelling, influential human beings and you, com and you combine them with compelling, influential brands. Now I believe you have what is probably the most powerful force on earth. So if you are looking for the next competitive advantage, if you are looking for untapped potential in what you do, I believe it is this. Become the thought leader, the influencer, the undisputed authority in your field. So how do we do that? Next logical question, right? How do we do that? It starts out by focusing on clarity. First, we have to get clear. If you're going to own a space, you had better be crystal clear about what space it is that you want to own. Absolutely crystal clear. When I first started out, you could own what we would call a macro space. Again, fancy way of saying just a very large space. You could be the guru of leadership. You could be the guru of wealth. You could be the guru of health. You could be the guru of gardening. Now there are far too many people across far too many platforms making far too much noise. You can't do that anymore. You can't be a generalist anymore. You'll get lost. Now the future belongs to what I would call micro-authorities, people who hyper-hyper-specialize, people who own a niche in a deep, deep way, where I know exactly the situation, the person, or the product that you specialize in, where I can find you fast and I know that you are talking to me. So I'm going to do a bit of a social experiment now. I'm a big fan of experiments. Who's got their mobile phone nearby? I know you all do. All right, what I want you to do, what I want you to do, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to give them like your creepiest smile. Just super creepy. That's not creepy. Like, all right, just think, I don't know, Donald Trump on a bus with beauty queens. Just <laughs> go creepier. That's terrifying. That's very good. All right, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to get their name if you don't already know it. And then I want you to Google them. I want you, I'm going to pump up the music. I'm going to get you to Google them. And then what I want you to do once you've Googled them is I want you to tell them, talk to them, and tell them what space you think they own based on what you find. I'm going to give you two minutes. Google each other. Report back. What space do you think that they own? All right. I'm going to bring you back. I love watching people do that. I love it. So who here, who here was, was, was MIA, missing in action, could not be found at all? It's a few few of you, who here was kind of like, eh, you know what, what my partner found, it was okay, it's not perfect, it's not what I would want, but it's all right, it's doable. No? Who here was just like, I, I nailed that, that was amazing, totally what I would have wanted. Awesome. Who here was just massively surprised to find out that they were actually a pole dancer living in Texas? <laughs> you laugh, there's usually a hand. So why did I get you to do that? Why did I get you to do that? I got you to do that because that's what we do, right? That's what we do now. We search for each other. According to Harvard University, over 50% of decisions are now made before anyone even makes contact with you, before anyone even reaches out, before anybody picks up the phone, before you know that they are looking, they have made a decision about you based on what they find online, over 50%. Now, Harvard have a technical term for it, I would call it just Google stalking. We've got very good at Google stalking. So I need to be able to find you fast. I need to be able to know exactly what you do. Micro authorities, people who have a very clear specialism, get four times more engagement than people who try and own too large a space than generalists, where I don't know that you're talking to me. Four times more. So, so how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we figure out what space? This is a question I get asked a lot. How do I figure out what space it is that I can own? What's a space that I can specialize in where I can go hard? Over the years, we developed this tool, and it's called Influence Intersections. Now, an Influence Intersection looks like this. It is where you take one space where you have mastery, insights, and, ex and experience, and you overlay it with another space where you have mastery, insights, and experience. And that space, that space in the middle, that is a space that only you can own. That is where you will stand out. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. Let's talk about Jamie Oliver. We saw him before. When ja I remember when Jamie first started out, there were a lot of chefs out there. There were a lot of very serious six-star chefs. They were French. They had big hats. Now, he was never going to stand out there. 
And he was a six-star chef. So what he did is he took another world where he had mastery, insights, and experience. The world of feeding a family quickly, on budget, in a healthy way. And that space, that space in the middle, that was where he stood out. That was a space that he could own. Let's pick another one that we saw before, Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs first started Apple, he couldn't compete with the Microsofts and the IBMs of this world on engineering, although he, was, he and Wozniak were equally great engineers. But he was never going to stand out there. So he took another world that he knew, the world of the creator, the world of the innovator, the world of the artist, and he overlaid it on top. And that space in the middle, that was a space where Apple dominated. So what two worlds can you overlay? What two languages can you speak? What two specialties do you know that you can combine the, the both and find a space where you can stand out? This is Jessica Heron. I don't know if any of you know of Stella and Dot out of the USA. Yep, network marketing company out of the USA. Jessica Heron is incredible. She founded it. When she first started out, she knew that if she was going to make any kind of a dent in that market, she was going to have to hyper-specialize. And so what she did was, when it came time to finding her target market, she went, OK, who am I talking to? I'm talking to women who have an interest in fashion, specifically in jewelry who have young children who are looking for additional income. That was the target market that she decided to pick. That was a specialism. However, this is where it gets interesting. Then, then she decided that she was going to use social fuel to reach that target market. So she started doing Facebook Live videos, and she started promoting them on Facebook. Because guess what? Facebook know more about your customer than you do. In fact, Facebook know more about your customer than your customer does. And that's what the digital world has enabled us to do. It has enabled us to get really hyper clear about how we want to target the people that we want to talk to. So she started asking questions. She started saying, OK, this woman that I want to reach, where does she live? Where do her children go to school? What does she buy? What brands is she already a fan of? What music acts does she like? How much disposable income does she have? That is how the digital world is changing influence. We can now take a global platform and get hyper specific about who we want to talk to, who we want to reach. You see this? 97,000 shares. Now, your average person on Facebook has 500 contacts. That's 50 million people. Now, Super Bowl ad reaches 110 million people, and it will cost you $5 million just to put it on the air. Massive difference. So again, I'm going to give you two minutes. Because I really, today, I really want to start some conversations with you guys. I really want to get you talking. I really want your brain to start thinking about these questions. Don't make it perfect. You just have to start. So if we could pump up the music. Two, two minutes. What two worlds can you combine? What two worlds can you combine in order to stand out? OK. I know that was very short, but we've got to keep moving. What two worlds can you combine? Hyper-specialism, what is your exact target market? Who are you exactly speaking to? And you will see this trend of becoming a micro-authority grow more and more over coming years. It's already completely upended the retail space. So I want you to start thinking about Start having these conversations. Getting clear. Next on the list, contribution. I want you to write this down. This is probably the most important thing that I'll say. Or you can forget the rest, but this is probably the most important thing that I'll say all day. And it is this, that the future belongs to those who out-contribute and not those who outspend their competitors. Future belongs to those who out-contribute and not those who outspend their competitors. Now, why is that? It's because the most impactful channels now are free, right? They're free. You can't outspend, you can't outshout, you can't out-interrupt everybody else anymore. And yet, I mean, I studied marketing. This has been the primary playbook of marketing for decades. Every single textbook that I learned at university boiled down to one of those three things. If you want to stand out, you need to outshout, outinterrupt, or outspend everybody else in the marketplace. And those don't work anymore as strategies. In fact, just who, who here loves being interrupted? No? You know, any of you just sat there on a Friday night going, I'm not going out? just in case somebody calls with an exclusive deal on life insurance. <laughs> no? Pop-ups, telemarketers, direct mail, no one's loving it. No. We hate it. We hate being interrupted. 
Quick, quick story, true story again. My mum, last year, my mum, total technophobe, and she, and she calls me and she was like, hey, up, love, because that, that is actually what she sounds like, by the way. Hey, up, love. She's like, I figured something out. What I do, what I do is I watch EastEnders, and then when it gets to the ad break, I press pause, and then I go and make a cup of tea, and then I come back, and then I fast forward all the ads. It's brilliant. So, now my mum doesn't even text, like she, occasional emoji face is the best that I will get. And so if she has figured out how to stop people from outspending to get her attention, to out shouting at her, to out interrupting her evening, if she has figured that out, she's 70, how much, how much scope do you give those strategies in the future? How much do you think that they're gonna, they're gonna last? They're not, are they? No, future belongs to those who out-contribute. We need to stop interrupting what people are interested in, and we need to start becoming what people are interested in. And so how do we do that? In my world, the best, the best way that I know how to do that is to become the primary translator, the primary translator for your target market. Now, what does that look like? To become the primary translator looks like this. It is where you go out to the fringes, to the edges, and you bring back for me on topics where I have neither the time, the bandwidth, or the experience to go, you bring back for me information that I care about in my language in easy to digest chunks. Now, why is that important? It is important because we have no shortage of information. The most influential person in the room used to be the person who had the most information. Do you remember the Encyclopedia Britannica? And now we have no shortage of information. You could, look, you could figure out how to make a hydrogen bomb by watching a YouTube video if you wanted to, terrifyingly. We have no shortage of information. None of you are sat there going, I just wish I had more information. None of us. What, what we need are the translators. Who we follow, who we buy from, who we are influenced by, are the people who are able to take all of that information and translate it for us in our language. Those are the winners. So you need to become the translator of your target market. And we do that by becoming a student of our target market, a student of the world of our target market. You need to be asking yourself, what questions are they asking? What are their challenges? What challenges do they know that they have? What challenges do they not know that they have? What opportunities are there out there for them? What how-tos do they need? What guidance are they looking for? In their language, not yours, in their language. That is a translator. So again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you one minute now because we've got to keep moving. One minute, if we could pump up the music, what I want you to do is I want you to pick from your world, who do you follow? Who do you read everything that they write, watch everything that they do? Follow them on Instagram, their newsletter, whatever it is. Who do you follow in your world and what do they translate for you? It might be business, it might be parenting, it might be gardening, it might be fashion, I don't know. What do they translate? Because I guarantee you, if you give them your attention, and the most valuable currency we have right now is our attention. Somebody said to me the other day that if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. Your attention is the product. Who do you give your attention to? Who do you follow? And why? What do they translate for you? One minute, quick discussion with the person next to you. Who do you follow and why? Pump up the music. Or I can sing. That's another option. Sing, sing, All right, I know we didn't get a song then, and I didn't sing. I also didn't dance. All right, I'm gonna bring you back. So, st I want you to start getting forensic about that. Where, who do you follow, why? Why did they get your attention? What did they do that got and kept your attention? What did they translate for you? And then start asking yourself, what do I need to be translating for my target market to get and keep their attention? Because the future belongs to the translators. I'm gonna share with you 
some translators from my, in my world at the moment. I wonder why, right? I wonder why. So these guys are pivotal in my world at the moment. Um, who here's got kids? Yep. Now, for those of you where that journey started in a hospital, you'll recognize this moment. You know the moment when someone, when you, you leave hospital the first time with your baby, and you're like this, like, <laughs> lest anyone should touch them, and you're, you're kind of just, you're looking behind you because you're convinced that someone's going to come running up and go, no. Like, you didn't actually think I was going to let you take that home, did you? Do you have any food in the fridge? And I'd be like, nope. I ate all of it while I was pregnant. I got nothing. And they don't. Amazingly, they don't. I don't know why they don't come. They should, but that's another conversation. So you get home, and what's one of the first things that you do when you get home? Cry. <laughs> oh, that is so true. No. <laughs> Someone had said, feed. No, if I was a better mother, I would potentially do that. The first thing that you do is you change a nappy. One of the first things that you do is you change a nappy. Now, if you're anything like me, I had no idea that small humans come in a variety of different sizes. I thought there was just one newborn. Apparently, that's wrong. And I had the wrong size nappy for my child. And so I got home, and baby, two husband, get dressed, go to the supermarket. And I get there, and I see this. Rows and rows of nappies, hundreds of nappies. And I am tired, and I am, I am overwhelmed and full of hormones, and I'm just about to melt into a puddle and start crying. And, and then I saw this, Marta. Any of you know Marta? Marta hospitals, Marta nurses, yep. Now, these guys had been the translators of my world for the past year. Well, for the past nine months, ever since I had first got pregnant. I would go for, for a meeting with my midwife, and I would, you know, I'd go with a list of all the things that I thought could hurt babies, and she'd be like, hats? Why on earth would hats be on your list? She'd like, just, just forget all of that. Forget all of that. And forget the birth, by the way, because, you know, that's going to happen. What I want you to focus on, I want you to focus on this. What are you going to do when you get home? You have no family here. You've got no one who's going to come in and cook for you. What are you going to do when you get home? What support do you have? And I'd be like, ah. I don't know. So okay, here's the number of a community nurse. I want you to call her. She'll come in. She'll, she'll have a meeting with you. She'll take care of you. Next up, what are you going to do about breastfeeding? Not everybody finds that easy. What are you going to do then? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. It's like, okay, here's the number of a lactation consultant. I want you to make an appointment with her. Go talk to her. Quick aside, by the way, I did a real estate conference recently, a room full of predominantly males, and I said there was lactation consultant, and there was just, it was like crickets. Everybody was, and there was this one guy in the middle who was like, gotcha, sister. I know what you're talking about. So, <laughs> thanks. So, the next question, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with all of this? How are you going to put this back together? And I was like, I don't know. Like, okay, here's the number of a physio. He's got a program. Make an appointment with him now. And go talk to him now, and then he'll put you on a program after the baby's born. They had become a student of their world. They had made themselves a student of my world. They knew my challenges, my opportunities before I did. And because of that, I would have bought anything from them. I would have bought anything. They could have had every product in the supermarket, and I would have bought it. Because those are the people that we trust, those are the people that we buy from, the people that take all the information and translate it for us. So become a student of the world of your customer and then become their translator. Next on the list, captivation. If the eyes and the ears of your target market belong to the translators, and they do, then the hearts of your target market belong to the storytellers the epic storytellers. Being a translator will get people's attention. Being an epic storyteller will keep people's attention. Why is that? Now, I've worked in the world of story for a really long time now. Um, storytellers in front of 20, storytellers in front of 20,000. And I, I've seen story done, do some incredible things. Story transcends logic. Story transcends language. Back in tribal days, two tribes would come together. They didn't even speak the same language, but they would tell each other their stories. Stories transcend language. It is through story I trust you. It is through story I engage with you. 
Story is the only way. If you tell me your story, if I know what it is to walk in your shoes, story is the only road to empathy. And empathy is the only road to emotion. And emotion is the only road to action. We only take action when propelled by emotion. Majority of the time. Emotion over logic, that's what, that's what gets us to take action. So you need to become an epic storyteller if you're going to keep people's attention in this day and age. Who can tell me who, can tell me who that is? Anyone know who that is? Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. Uh, quick spoiler alert on Al Gore. Al Gore, ex-presidential candidate, didn't win, um, was understandably very sad about that, and grew a massive beard and got on a boat. And he went traveling around the world just to, to to think about what happened for a while, and what he found disturbed him. What he found were ecosystems that were struggling, animals that were dying, um, what he found was waste, what he found was it was a world that had more problems than he knew about from a climate change point of view. And he came back determined to do something about it. And so what he did was this. He did an epic story, a one-hour story, a one-hour presentation called An Inconvenient Truth. An inconvenient truth. Everywhere an inconvenient truth, this one story was shown, 50% of people offset their carbon for the year. So that is to say that 50% of people took direct financial action. How would you, how would you like that if 50% of people that you came into contact with took direct financial action? That'd be pretty amazing, right? 50% of people. Now bear in mind that the scientists and the climatologists have been trying to get our attention on climate change for a decade. They had been using stats, graphs, pie charts, case studies, technical language. Nothing got to us. We did nothing. Al Gore tells one epic story, one hour long story, and we start taking action, financial action. Why? I believe it is because he took that story and he made it our story. He was talking about the air that we're going to be breathing 10 years from now, the animals that our children are going to be able to enjoy the environments that our homes are going to be in, and how that's going to feel when you walk out of your door every morning. He took that story and he made it our story. And that's why it got cut through. That is epic storytelling. Now, there might be some of you who are sat there, which I would understand, sat there going, well, do you know, he's, uh, he's Al Gore. Like, he's an ex-presidential candidate. He's probably very charismatic. He's probably got access to millions of dollars, huge production, tons of research. He's almost certainly an extrovert. And I'm not any of those things. I don't have any of those things. And if that's your story, that's fine. I just want to invite you, just to, like pop it over there. Just pop it in the corner for a second. Because I want to show you something else that I think busts it. I saw my client's name on the front page of the newspaper. A few months earlier, I had written the life insurance for this father of three, young guy, starting his construction business. And when I saw the name, I thought, no, no, it can't be him. But I turned the page, and there was his picture, and it was him. And they had died in a plane crash. So I went into my office, and I called his now widow on the phone and told her, don't worry. It's all going to be OK. I, we don't have to do anything today. I'll be with you. And that night before I went home, I thought, you know, I can go over and at least see, make sure she and her three kids are okay, maybe get some groceries, something. But when I got to their neighborhood, I had to park two blocks away because there were cars lining the streets everywhere. When I got to their house, the front door was open, and the home was packed with people. And so I stood there, and there was a woman at the door who said, would you like to sign the guest book? So I bent down to sign the guest book, and I thought, I'll come back when it's not so busy. And right then, she saw me, and she squealed really loud my name and came running through the house and grabbed a hold of me and just was squishing me really good and said, whispered in my ear, you're the only one who can help. You're the only one who can help. And I looked at all those people around her, all those people that love her, and I realized, and it struck me, there is something uniquely that we do, that we are the only one who can really make a difference in that situation. 
Who here would buy from her? Hands up. Yeah. Who here would trust her, engage with her? Yeah. Now, she's an insurance agent out of the USA. That story is called The Worst and the Best Day of My Career. The Worst and the Best Day of My Career. She uses it as on her email signature. Now, she's not highly charismatic, is she? There's not a lot of production going on there. Not a lot of money spent. But how compelling is that? Now, that is the power of epic storytelling. So what is, let's break this down a little bit more, epic storytelling. What does it actually look like? In my experience, epic storytelling has three main factors associated with it. Number one, number one, is it personal? Do I believe you? Do I believe you? Have you walked this road before? Or have you held the hand of somebody else who has walked this road before? Do I believe you? Have you done what you said you can do? Second one, is it relevant? And this one get, gets missed so much. Is it relevant to my world as your target market? Is it relevant to a challenge I am facing, to an opportunity I want to take advantage of? Is it relevant to me? We have one rule in my office when it comes to marketing. It's called the keep it or share it rule. Nothing leaves the building, no marketing leaves the building unless it is relevant for someone to either A, keep, refer back to later, or B, share it with everybody else they know or some people that they know. Keep it or share it. If it doesn't meet that rule, it doesn't leave. And I get, I get so many emails. You know, it's, it's our 10-year anniversary. And you're like, yay for you. Delete. Is it relevant to me, the person you are sending it to? Lastly, is it a motive? Now, what I mean by a motive, I don't mean is it dramatic. You know, there's a lot of cheap ways to get people's attention using emotional, or dramatic language. I don't mean that. What I mean by a motive is, is it using the language of your target market? Is it using their words? Or is it using technical jargon, stats? I'm such a stat geek. We all do it. We all use jargon, brochures, things to hide behind when we're nervous. Is it using the language of your target market? Every target market has what we would call charismatic language, language they use. If you don't know what the language of your target market is, go and find it because that is the language that will elicit emotion. So my final time, my last time, I'm going to give you 30 seconds at this point. You guys have access to so many incredible stories. I have heard some of your stories. I have researched some of your stories. I have been talking about some of your stories. Behind the scenes stories, personal stories, product stories, client stories. You heard a story just before I got on this stage. What stories can you be sharing? What epic stories can you be telling in order to emotionally engage with the people you're trying to reach? 30 seconds, quick chat with the person next to you. See if we've got any music. They're going to shake their head at me. Oh, no, we do. 30 seconds. All right, I know that was more like 20, but we've got to keep going. Keep these conversations going. What stories can we share? How can you share each other's stories more? How can you support and lift each other up and the incredible things that you're doing? Epic storytelling. I want to share with you, a story. I want to, there's one thing that will stop you from doing everything that I've said today, and it is this. It, it, it's this word, perfect. Now, I want to share with you a story from my own life. These headphones, these headphones were the bane of my life for two years. Now, this is the first time I've ever told this story with my husband in the room. My husband's at the back there. And he's a big part of this story, so I'm going to have to be very careful. So two years, really about three years ago, my husband came running into the room, running into the room, and he was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. I have, I've just found this pair of headphones, and they're going, to, they're going to totally revolutionize my ears. It's going to revolutionize sound. It's like at the cutting edge of everything. I've been looking for this my entire life. I just, I have to have these headphones. And I was like, how much are they? <laughs> it's $500. I was like, fine. I know you've already done it. I don't even know why you're asking me. Fine. So he goes off, he buys the headphones. Six months later, six months later, I'm, just, I'm in the kitchen and I'm thinking, what happened to those headphones? Those revolutionized my ears, headphones. And so I was like, hun, you know those headphones you were telling me about? What happened to them? And he said, oh, oh, all right. Um, 
let me tell you a story. So, what happened was, engineering had a fight with finance because engineering wanted to create this brand new incredible technology to put into the headphones. It was, it's immersive sound technology where if you wanted to, you could get closer to the source of the sound. Or if you didn't, you could just step back from the sound. And I'm thinking, isn't that volume? I'm sure that's volume. But anyway, and finance wouldn't pay for it, understandably, because it's just volume. And, but then engineering said, I'm not, I, we won't make the headphones. And then finance were like, fine, we'll pay for it. And now they're making them, they're still making them, so I, I don't have them. I'm like, okay, fine. Fast forward a year, a year later. I'm like, what happened to those headphones? And he's like, oh, oh, okay, let me tell you a story. It's like, what happened is, what happened is they came up with this brand new technology where what they want to do is they, the, the, the headphones themselves are going to actually scan your brain. They're going to scan your skull and they're going to put a 3D representation of your skull on your iPhone via an app where you can actually see how the sound resonates in different parts of your skull in 3D in color on your phone. And I was like, you don't have them, do you? He's like, no, I don't have them. <laughs> Fast forward another six months. So we are now two years. Two years after he first bought these headphones, and then this happens. Something happens. There we go. This happens. Have you ever seen anyone look so smug? <laughs> no, never. And so he comes running in, and he has his headphones. And he is beyond excited which just drives me crazy because I can't figure it out. He should not be excited. This should be the worst customer journey ever. He should be angry, spreading you know, things on the internet about how terrible this company is. He should not be excited. And he is. Why? Why is he still excited about this product? Pardon? It works. You would hope after all of that it works. Pardon? I, can't, I couldn't make that out. But he wanted it. Absolutely, he wanted it. I'll tell you why I think he's still excited. He's still excited because they took him on the journey. He's excited because they became the translators of his world, of something he cared about, tech when it comes to sound. They became the translators of his world. They went out to the fringes where he had neither the time nor the bandwidth nor the experience to go, and they brought it back for him in his language, in epic stories along the way. That's why he was still excited. That's what we need. And so if what's stopping you Oh, and by the way, I'm really not advocating that you, sp you take 10 years to deliver your product, or two years, sorry. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't take that home. But if what is stopping you is that you are not perfect, that there is no perfect set of rules yet, that this is not a perfect environment, then stop. Focus on being the translator. Focus on epic stories. Focus on showing up. Focus on your process, not on being perfect. We're not interested in your perfect. Reality TV has gone through the roof. We don't care about perfect anymore. We care about compelling, showing up with your process and your journey. I'm going to leave you, leave you there. I'm going to leave you this, with this one word, certainty. You will notice that I have not said the word confidence once in this whole presentation. And there's a reason I haven't said the word confidence, and that is because I, I hate that word. I hate the word confidence. And I hate the word confidence because I have seen way too many brilliant people and way too many brilliant ideas derailed by that word, left on the sidelines by that word. And usually it looks something like this. I will stand up and be seen, step up from behind the brand, put my hand up, get on the stage, write a blog, film a video, disagree when I feel more confident. Now, I can promise you, I've been doing this for a really long time, and there is no such thing as confidence. Confidence shows up when we show up. Influence shows up when we show up. It is the ingredients. It is not the result. You don't start out confident. Who, st who starts out at anything confident? My two-year-old, she doesn't expect to start confident. She'll do something 50 times, and I'll say, do you feel confident now? And she'll be like, Meh. You have to show up before confidence shows up. It is the result and not the ingredient. What I want for you isn't confidence. What I want for you is certainty. Certainty, you could go and you could grab it right now. Certainty is a downward sensation. It's when you own the sp your space, you own the ground you stand on. 
Certainty is when you say, today, given everything I know, everywhere I have been, everything I have learned, I give you the best of what I have. You see, everybody who got on this stage today had certainty. I offer you the best that I have. And tomorrow, if I change my mind, if some new piece of information comes up, I will adapt. But today, I give you the best that I have. That is certainty. You could have that today. Forget confidence. By the time confidence shows up, I promise you, you won't even care. You'll be so far ahead of the curve. So, what, I, what do I want you to do? I want you to go out there. I want you to become influencers in your space. I want you to get clear in the space you want to own. I want you to out-contribute everybody else. I want you to become the primary translator, tell epic stories, and most of all, develop certainty, communicate with certainty. Because influence, it doesn't live out there in the social media environment. It's an inside job. Thank you very much for your time. I got to do, I got to do, I got to do all the things, I got to do.